Uh, welcome to PNC in the real world. Um, we're addressing considerations for 15118 implementation and scaling. Um, my name is Jason Yu. I'm from AutoCrypt. Uh, we're an automotive security software company. Uh, we work with a variety of different clients, but our two key clients are is the is Hyundai uh, for PNC implementation. Um, and also Kepco, which is a major electricity provider out here in South Korea. Um, this came about because uh, Kepco wanted to put together a POC environment for PNC uh, in expectation of a commercial rollout of PNC next year. Um, so um, I'll give you uh, uh, a brief company introduction um, uh, for those who may not know anything about AutoCrypt. Uh, and then I'll go through uh, how this case study came about. Um, and then uh, part three will deal with, uh, it's it's a little bit lengthy, but um, I think each of the uh, concerns that were raised by the white paper uh, that was mentioned earlier by EONT, Digicert, and ChargePoint uh, need to be addressed. So uh, I'll be doing that. And then I'll be concluding with final thoughts. So a uh, brief company introduction. Uh, this is the overview. Uh, our headquarters and R&D center um, are in South Korea. We have branch offices, uh, two in China, one in Tokyo, and one in San Jose. Uh, we're established August of 2019, but we were spun off from Penta Security Systems, which is an enterprise security company that was established in 1997. Uh, in terms of the business areas, uh, we uh, provide a automotive firewall slash IDS solution for the internal network of cars. Um, but cars, as everyone knows, is uh, starting to communicate uh, with the outside world. So we do extensive work in the V2X security area. Um, uh, so uh, when vehicles communicate with other vehicles or roadside equipment or pedestrians, um, where we provide modules uh, and PKI solutions for that. Um, and also the integration of mobile devices. So the v, uh, V2D, uh, vehicle to device security solutions. Uh, we've expanded into that area. Of course, the area that I'm going to talk about today is in the V2G area, um, how the vehicle can connect to the grid for a variety of different solutions, uh, including charging through plug and charge. Uh, finally, all of these external communications produces a lot of uh, useful uh, user data. So um, in order to use that data for fleet management system services and sort of managed service solutions, um, we're involved in that area as well. In terms of the history, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the enterprise security uh, company, Penta Security, was uh, founded in 1997. But we started providing automotive security solutions in 2007, and we've provided 14 security solutions uh, ever since. Uh, and starting in 2016, uh, we started to uh, provide security and became the security head for Smart Road or CITS construction projects in South Korea. Uh, we've expanded that position uh, considerably since then, um, and we've also expanded um, our automotive security software solutions into the B2G uh, and the fleet management services area. AutoCrypt has uh, received industry recognition for its innovative security solutions. Uh, last year, under Pencil Security, before we spun off into AutoCrypt, uh, TU, TU Automotive Awards recognized uh, uh, Pencil Security as the best auto cybersecurity product and service. Uh, this year, we've been shortlisted as AutoCrypt uh, for the Industry Choice Award for the Automotive Tech Company of the Year. Uh, in order to be in the space, uh, industry cooperation and contributions is very important to us. Uh, that includes the development of global standards and automotive and transport solutions. Uh, these are some of the areas that, uh, that we are very active in, uh, both as AutoCrypt and as Pencil Security. Uh, some of these deal with B2X solutions, but for the B2G uh, area, uh, we've been members of Charin for, about, uh, for over three years, and we're also regular contributors at the ISO 15118 uh, testing symposium. 
I also want to take this moment to uh, introduce GridWiz, um, and there are uh, the uh, we're working with them to uh, provide the Korean PKI for today's uh, exciting interoperability demo. Uh, GridWiz was uh, started in 2013 to provide communication solutions for EVs and EVSCs. Uh, they were the first Charin member from South Korea. Uh, in South Korea, 90% of DC chargers have GridWiz solutions embedded for, the, for their communications. And overall, they have uh, 60 customers in over 18 countries for SCCC and EVCC solutions. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the background for the case study. So the, the client that we're talking about is the Korea Electric Power Corporation. Uh, it's the largest electric utility in Korea involved in all aspects of electric generation. But they're also uh, committed to sustainable energy, including EV charging. Uh, in December of last year, South Korea's Ministry of Environment said that TEPCO will deploy 20,000 public chargers, uh, including 1,500 fast chargers by the end of this year. So when we engaged with them to uh, develop a PNC environment uh, versus a POC uh, uh, and later to be a commercial rollout, they really wanted us to look at uh, the, the white paper that was mentioned before, the practical considerations white paper that was authored by Digister ChargePoint and Neonti and published on May 14th of last year. Uh, this was a PKI for full-scale full scale implementation of ISO 15118 for EV charging. Um, and uh, one of the key conclusions uh, for this uh, white paper essentially is that a commercial rollout is not prudent at this time and may negatively impact the proposed goals of the EV charging through 15118. And the reason that the white paper gave for its, its conclusions was that there's no best practice available. Uh, so there isn't enough uh, instructions, enough requirements in ISO 15118. Um, certainly the technology seems attractive, but there's too many questions left. And in order to move forward um, with ISO, with so many questions, um, the white paper concluded that it would be dangerous to do so. Uh, EVs and EVSCs would not work outside their, outside their local network. Uh, it could also open up the ecosystem to attacks um, and concluded that updates will be cumbersome, thereby increasing costs and loss of revenue. So what needs to happen, uh, it, it said that it, ISO 15118 needs to um, address all of these concerns that were laid out in the white paper uh, to ensure a, a feasible commercial deployment. And also <clears throat> all of the stakeholders need to address all of these issues before any products are launched. So uh, we, the white paper provided a good uh, roadmap for us uh, to be able to uh, address some of these when we imagined what what would really need to happen for PNCs to be out into the real world. Um, just to give a little background on the current state and evaluation rankings, um, the authors of the white paper used this system to determine how undeveloped um, all the way up to specialized the system was. Most of the grades, of course, uh, landed on the left side, as you'll see throughout this paper. So I'll first be going through the governance uh, areas. Um, and the certificate policy, uh, uh, Andreas, I'm a part of his uh, PKI task force, and, and he uh, is a very capable leader of that. Um, and he mentioned earlier, um, talked a little bit about certificate policy, so I don't want to go too much into it. But for us, it's essentially a way to make sure that certificates used in a PKI system can be trustworthy, which is pretty much what he said. Um, he also mentioned RFC 3647, which it could be a worldwide standard that, that could be used as a template to put this document together. And we use that as well. Uh, we also uh, made sure that the root CA certificate policy has the access URL. And this is a way uh, that all the the uh, certificates are, uh, are generated in the POC system. 
Uh, to take it one step further, the CPS um, the, or the Certificate Practice Statement essentially shows how the CA operates in compliance with the CP. Uh, it's an essential document, and I'll be mentioning it many times through this uh, presentation. And we also uh, use RFC 3647 um, for, to, to develop and distribute this document. And again, the access URLs included in the root CA's certificate policy field. The audit policy is to make sure that um, all the requirements are being followed. Um, and uh, we also included this into the CP and CPS of the KEPCO system. Um, and this is an issue that's going to come on uh, repeatedly, but it's really up to this the PKI operator or the business agency or government agency that's trying to establish a PKI uh, system. Um, so we we can't really determine whether it's really up to ISO 15118 to um, you know require an audit system or or to provide an audit audit policy for all these businesses, um, but we certainly did um, in the CPN CPS. In terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of algorithm and product protocols, the white paper um, said that it needs a wider range of algorithms and protocols. Um, I, we think that the, uh, the the algorithms that are provided by uh, 15118 will do for now. It's been secure for 20 years. Um, and we think that perhaps it could be secure for the next few decades, although um, we're watching that closely. But we expect uh, this, uh, the urgency to use a broader range to evolve uh, in the future at some inevitable point. Um, but a, the white paper is absolutely correct when it says a broader scope is needed, uh, especially in the back end communications behind the charging point. For uh, business continuity and and disaster recovery, uh, it also pointed out that uh, this is not labeled uh, in the uh, 15118 um, document. Um, and we included this into the CPS document as well. Uh, one, of the, one of the key features is uh, the certificate management cycle method and disaster recovery, uh, which are included in, in uh, two different sections of the CPS document. Um, the certificate revocation policy needs to be a requirement. Um, we want to point out that uh, in 15118-20, um, the CRD, the CRL distribution points and authority information access, these, <clears throat> these features that um, uh, the white paper said would, are, are really necessary are going to be mandatory in the next version of 15118. Um, in terms of uh, for the KEPCO system, uh, we included that into the CPS document. Uh, for risk management, uh, as Andreas pointed out before, a lot of this isn't just technology. It's, it's, uh, you know, it has to do with operations and governance. And um, we put that, uh, it's really the responsibility of the operating network system. And um, we don't think it necessarily needs to be included in 15118. So we include it into the CPS document for our client. Now we head over to the technology components and the next, the next seven uh, components will, will deal with uh, the technology aspects. Um, the number of tiers has nothing to do with security. So the white paper is absolutely right about that. Um, it, the, the white paper essentially said um, it, the 15118 does not determine whether you need a two or three tier system. Um, we don't think it has any relevance to security, uh, and so it really can be determined by the operating authority. Um, for us, the POC phase was operated with a three tier system as 15118 um, uh, prescribes, but this does not necessarily mean that the commercial rollouts will follow the same system. In fact, a lot of the um, the systems that, that we're seeing on the PNC front are two-tier systems, and we expect a lot of them to be two-tier systems. 
Uh, in terms of assurance level, uh, the, the white paper pointed out correctly that there's no requirements for assurance level. Uh, for us, we use the International Telecommunication Union's X.500 uh, standard. Uh, this meant that digital signatures uh, based on private key values are used to identify users. Um, and this was uh, detailed in the C CPS document. In terms of uh, physical security, um, they're not detailed in 15118, is what the white paper pointed out. Uh, for us, the CPS requires that the private keys within MUCA are stored in an HSM uh, that's rated at FIPS level two or above, uh, and also operated offline. Uh, for the CPS also require that sub-CA keys are stored in an HSM, not necessarily at FIPS level two, um, um, and also protected from unauthorized access. And all these are detailed in the CPS document. In terms of the disaster uh, recovery um, infrastructure, uh, the white paper pointed out that the 15018 does not provide a way of determining how to impact CA failure. Uh, we Again, we think that this is really subject to the uh, implementation of the um, uh, an enterprise or agency that's trying to set up the PKI system and thus cannot be required by 15018. But we did include it into the CPS document. Uh, for key management, uh, we specify the EC parameter as, as shown for the B2G route as well as for the CPO, CPS, sub CAs uh, per the recommendation of 15018. Uh, we put this into the CPAS document, uh, in which details key storage backup and recovery process. Um, in terms of the, the protocols, um, in South Korea's public sector, there's a specific, very specific protocol that used to be uh, that needs to be used for backup communications. Uh, but we agree with the white paper, uh, white paper in the sense that there are no limitations to the backend communications. Um, and I think each of the uh, country or territory that the PKI system is going to be built in is going to determine what that um, protocol and algorithm is going to be. Uh, we do think that the EV side should follow ISO 15118. And that's the ISO 15118 really only determines the communications between the car and the charger. Anyhow, um, in terms of the certificate revocation infrastructure, um, our, our CPS document requires that the CRLs, including complete Delta CRLs, are supported. Uh, we also uh, require that the OCSP is supported when the server is undergoing online revocation or status checking in real time. Uh, we also want to point out that uh, CRL and OCSP certificate profiles will be mandatory in the next version of 15118, uh, making this particular uh, concern addressed in the next version of 15118. So now we're moving on to operations, and this is the last section. So the next seven slides will deal with operation guide limitations according to the white paper. Um, and uh, for our for, for identity access management, um, the CPS included security policies for those who are authorized to access the root CA, which is again is uh, listed offline. Um, this particular section also had a list of job titles and key responsibilities for those job titles, uh, which were uh, provided in the CPS. For the certificate lifestyle uh, life cycle management, um, we. And that's, this is a certainly justified criticism that there um, there aren't cert certificate life life cycle management requirements, how they're issued, monitored, and tracked, et cetera. Um, for one thing, uh, we think that a trusted time source needs to be established by the ED OEMs, um, and it's not currently in place. There are certain ideas, um, 15118, um, suggests that perhaps a timestamp from the EVSE can be used for this trusted time source. Uh, um, perhaps the EVs could use their GPS systems for this information, but it hasn't been established on the OEM side yet. 
Also, we think that the OEMs um, should also establish a root CA certificate mechanism, uh, uh, which also is not in place yet. Um, to cert for certificate revocation, um, in terms of more details on how and why the certificates can be revoked, uh, for the KEPCO uh, POC environment, um, we made it possible to enable revocation when the EV is to be scrapped. Um, the certificate can also be revoked when the EVSC is being collected or disabled. Um, and thirdly, the uh, certificate revocation is managed separately from contract validation periods. Uh, and this was, of course, again, included in the CPS document. Uh, for a certificate uh, repository, uh, this was another good point made by the white paper. Uh, the VD application guide um, assumes that there can be a certificate repository service, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, we, we think that for the time being, the V2G root CA should be available to any use EV user um, and should be available on a website. Of course, um, that website needs to be fortified so that the certs are uh, on a secure website. Uh, for incident response, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, this, for us, it was limited to the root CA being maintained in an offline setting and the private keys uh, being stored in an HSM uh, fifth level two or above. Um, the CPS also requires that only permitted individuals can access the root CA uh, in, in the offline uh, um, in the offline status. Um, if the root CA private keys has been compromised, all certification system is shut down and all certificates are revoked. This is pretty common practice. And all of these were included in the compromise and disaster recovery section of the CPS. Uh, PC, PKI compliance and audit. Uh, this is uh, a, another area uh, where I don't know how all root CA operators can audit themselves and audit each other. I think th these are questions that still need to be answered. Uh, for the um, for our client, we said the CA log must be archived and periodically audited, um, and details for these audit procedures were included in the CPS document. And finally, for cross certification, uh, there's uh, the white paper pointed out that there's no common baseline for PKI requirements and audit policies when enabling cross certification. Um, for uh, when we address this for KEPCO, uh, we said that before any cross certification can um, can occur, the operators on both sides should agree to a security audit so that they can trust each other. Um, from a technology standpoint, uh, we pointed out that if if one of the root CA experiences a security compromising incident, a hack, um, cross certificates can immediately be re both by the non-compromise uh, ent entity, thereby uh, disabling the cross certification altogether. So I, I went through a lot of details. Um, <clears throat> I hope uh, uh, it was it was okay for you. For, uh, but we thought that the details were pretty important and to address all the very good points made by the, the white paper. Um, I just had some final thoughts. Uh, the white paper was again a very valuable roadmap for us. Um, the the Cape uh, KEPCO case study compelled us to look at it very closely and to come up with some sort of a way for, to pay forward um, in order to have uh, PNC in the real world. Um, but we do think that ISO 15118 cannot address all of the concerns established in this white paper on its own. Uh, instead, we think that the stakeholders of the EV charging uh, universe needs to take responsibility for uh, secure EV charging. Uh, this means that entities looking to establish PKI systems should set up a CP and CPS, as Andreas mentioned before, before any commercial system can be implemented. Also, OEMs can implement features. I mentioned the trusted time source uh, and a root CA uh, maintenance mechanism um, uh, to make, just to, to bridge any technology gaps um, for safe implementation. Um, but this still leaves a question, how can stakeholders create a common baseline of trust? Um, I think, uh, um, you know, the PKI task force is a great place to start. 
a uh, lot of industry uh, cooperation because we heard from SAE and they're trying to do the same thing. Um, and it's all geared towards, uh, for us, the same uh, goal uh, that PKI operators uh, need to trust each other within a B2G ecosystem. Um, the KEPCO case study we did, that was just for one root CA uh, system. So um, what we're going to see later is multiple root CAs communicating with each other. So that's already happening. Um, so that we think that these sorts of concerns that are laid out by the white paper and that we address to a large extent uh, through our case study will only be exacerbated with the onset of interoperability. Speaking of interoperability, um, you know, I get asked, we started talking about this uh, last year and uh, we we're constantly asked why interoperability? Um, and it's a real world need uh, that uh, uh, that needs to happen because OEMs can't predict all the V2G routes that its vehicles need to trust. I don't wanna to get too much into it, but um, if a car is manufacturing in a certain country and needs to be exported to a foreign country, it can't predict all of, it can't even predict where the car is going to be exported to, no less what V2G routes in those foreign territories and needs to connect to. Also, those V2G routes can change over time. Um, that's certainly a, 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 um, an expected outcome. Um, so uh, it's impossible for OEMs to know all of this when it comes out to the lot. That means um, the rest of the stakeholders needs to have a technological solution uh, that allows all of these cars to work in all of the different V2G areas uh, that are expected across the globe. But again, um, uh, today's demo shows the technical technological feasibility of one way of interoperability uh, through the cross certification, which we like because it really doesn't uh, it stays true to the tenets of 15118 um, and and does not uh, require us to uh, you know write it all over again. But still, um, we still need trust as a backbone of interoperability. Uh, root CAs and sub CAs need to trust each other for PNC to work worldwide. Um, again, the need for a common understanding becomes very uh, apparent among, uh, between the stakeholders. Um, we certainly think that 15118 certainly has a place at the table, but uh, I, I don't think it's uh, the one area that can have the ultimate authority to determine how this uh, future is going to work. Um, and uh, we're going to show, today's demo only shows two root CAs interoperating with one another. Um, scalability is a looming issue for us and, and something that we're thinking about uh, as is one, uh, ISO 15118. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is um, since we're only showing interoperability between two root CAs and, and it's certainly technologically feasible, but what would happen if there's many, many more uh, root CAs that need to be interoperable with each other? Um, certainly performance issues, scalability issues are going to um, be inevitable in this future world. So uh, there needs to be not only technological solutions, but also governance and operations uh, solutions to be able to address this need. Uh, nonetheless, I think uh, the, today's uh, interoperability uh, demo is something that all of us, uh, not only us at Autocrypt, but um, th through the ELOT and LP um, interoperability demo task force, we've been talking about for a long time. And a lot of uh, very capable uh, stakeholders have been uh, building up to this point, and and we think that uh, in spite of all the limitations that we see, uh, you know, it's it's really great to see all of us pushing forward together. Um, again, the cross certification is and interoperability is a real world need, so please stay tuned uh, for the demo uh, to see how the cross certification can work in the in the in the future for a um, global scale. Uh, EV charging environment. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jason. We are a little bit short in time, but before we go to the demo, I would ask you some questions we got. Um, maybe quick um, web browsers consider CRLs and uh, OSCP as not working in practice. 
and try to foster the use of uh, short-term certificates and regular key changes. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Uh, I'm sorry, I, it, you broke out on that. Can you please repeat that? Oh, please. Uh, web, uh, web browsers uh, consider CRLS, uh, CRLs uh, and OSC mm -hmm. as not working in practice. Uh, they mm -hmm. try to foster the use of short-term certificates and regular key changes. What is your mm -hmm. opinion on that? Um, I, th I think that's uh, an issue that, that certainly needs to be addressed. Um, the problem with web, and, and this goes back to our um, enterprise security background, anything open to the web um, really needs to be built from the start with security in mind um, so that there can be trust for, for the communications. Um, it, it's a technological limitations of web browsers, um, but um, for the POC system that we're working on um, and for the commercial rollout, uh, we'll have to build a uh, better um, uh, web-based system to be able to deal with those limitations. Okay, and final question for you for now. Um, with your CPS in place, how would you rate ISO 15118 on the scale from one to five? Um, we think that ISO 15118 um, with a VDE application is, is a great start um, in, in terms of when we first got involved with ISO 15118, we just we really were just involved with the TLS um, communications between the car and the charger. Um, and two short years later, here we are talking about interoperability. So I think it's certainly a um, organic uh, document that's going to um, need a lot of stakeholder input to make it into a complete um, um, commercially viable uh, document that can support uh, the interoperable uh, EV charging systems. 